You can listen to The Professional Left wherever you get your podcasts, on Netroots Radio, or at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a PayPal button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. This is the podcast for February 5th, 2021. It's not safe for work. Recorded live from the world headquarters of the Cornfield Resistance, where we think watching Vice President Kamala Harris wielding her mighty axe, tiebreaker, was as cool as any Marvel movie. It's the professional left with Drift Glass and Blue Gal. Somebody pointed out that... Uh... Madam Vice President, you know, is MVP. And that's just perfect. Damn right. Uh, Damn right. We actually have a title for the show, adapted from the greatest legal brief ever written, which is, The Earth is Round Again. Again. Um, Yes, exactly. It's just making me smile right now. It's hard to get your your sea legs under that and not wake up every morning. You know, when you've woken up every morning for four years going, what did he tweet this morning? What? 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 Just You know, what disaster awaits us? And you don't have to do that. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, a, uh, do I have, and I don't want to look at my phone. I don't want to look at the computer. I don't want to, but that is actually literally our job. It has been our job Mm -hmm. for Mm -hmm. going on 12 years now. Am I right? Mm -hmm. In that that blue gal? Um, We're in our 12th year. No, the earth is round. Um, Two and two is four. And Joe Biden is, in fact, the president of the United States. And that's just the way that is. It's a strange the, – the monster is still under the bed, but it's back under the bed. Yeah. So we've got just a little bit of housekeeping to do today. Uh, we sent out for Christmas a postcard to as many of our contributors as I could gather. Uh, but we missed some people. And uh, we got a letter from one of them, Randy. Hey, Randy. And – Randy. Hi, Randy. Randy says, hello, my name is Randy. I am an American living in Luxembourg. I think this is the first time I've ever contacted a podcaster. I've been a supporter for a few years now on PayPal, giving a little every month and a couple of bigger donations. Nine times out of 10, I give without expecting anything in return. I love your podcast and have been listening for years with my son. I cried while I was driving to Italy with my son when you were talking about not being able to get your son's medicine. Oh, that's a long time ago. That really is. Yeah, you're you're old school. Thanks for sticking Uh, with us, Randy. Thanks for sticking with us. I was just talking to Junior Dude, his home, just this week, and uh, he's 22 now. So And And he's he's getting his own medicine. (laughs) Of of various types, we should say. Yeah, but he he has really taken charge of his prescriptions and... Uh is doing that all by himself, which is such a a wonderful thing. Uh, Last month, you mentioned that you had sent Christmas cards to supporters. You also mentioned that for those living overseas, you would send it by email. Well, I did search for it and looked in my spam folder and found nothing. It's such a little thing, and I don't know why I should feel upset about it. No, you should feel upset about it. Of course you should. I just have to ask, why haven't I received one? And the answer is, I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I'm so sorry, Randy. I don't know why you haven't received one. However, I was glad to send one out. Uh, anyway, I'm glad you're still going strong and also bringing back Science Fiction University. That's what my son and I bonded over. Oh, oh fun. Oh, cool. Yeah. Thanks for reading this sincerely. And uh, so, as I said, I'm so sorry. I did send one out, but it went out kind of late. I'm delighted to send it to you today. And thank you for letting me know. Mm-hmm. And I will read your email on the air in case we missed other people. Uh, you should also, probably... Oh, I just want to mention that I do uh, check our PO box pretty regularly, and mm-hmm. uh, we get we're getting back about about one percent of our the cards we send. Yeah, out. it's it's um, more than an average year in right. terms of the number that we're are getting returned to sender. Right. So here's the deal: if you're overseas and you haven't received our postcard uh, by email, uh, email us at proleftpod at gmail dot com. Mm-hmm. Uh, Put in your subject line postcard, and I will email you the front and back of our postcard. If you're in the U.S., I have a few left. And while supplies last, if you email me your name and address and correct mailing address, uh, again, I'll be glad to send out another one to you. Mm -hmm. Um, Whether you're a regular contributor or not, we're happy to send one out as long as I have them. I'm glad to put an address on it, and I I have enough postcard stamps for sure. So. And I will uh, say actually, that we have donors that have sent us stamps, so we're yeah. just really grateful for that. 
I would like to mention that the staff who screwed this up have been sacked. Um, <laughs> so there's no. I don't, don't know what you're, he's talking about. <laughs> I wish I wish that the postmaster general would be sacked, but yeah. they are working on that. Um, in in any event, we want you to know how much we love you, and uh, these are you know the 2020 dumpster fire stop the steal postcards to stop yes. people from stealing drift glasses idea of dumpster fire mm-hmm. uh that's the theme of the postcard and again overseas we just can't trust the mail to get it to you so i'm happy to email it to you in the us uh if you would like one just let us know your address and please please because i get seven, 700 emails a day literally uh please put postcard in the subject line of the email. I, I will say one more thing, if you don't mind. You always is, say one more thing. Yeah, I got that. one more thing to say. I'm, I'm just going to pull <laughs> up a, a note from deep in the notes just because it's, mm-hmm. it's more of a housekeeping thing. Um, yeah. I am grateful that uh, my uh, my coinage of Dumpster Fire was on my blog in 2006 and not on Twitter because none of my tweets are there anymore. They're <laughs> all right. gone. They're all burned. They've all been burned in some sort of fire, in some sort of dumpster container. I'm not sure how, how better to describe it. Um, so it actually still exists and proof exists out there in the universe. This is by way of me saying that I am still permanently banned from Twitter for calling yeah. a crazy person trash who stepped to me on Twitter uh, without any prompting and called me batshit crazy because that's mm-hmm. what permanently means. I'm permanently banned from Twitter. Um, I would like to thank friends like Ten Grain, who every day smuggles my missives out to the world. He does. And I will say that I am actually writing more long-form blog stuff that is currently being read by a lot fewer people. Uh, <laughs> than your tweets? <laughs> the, the only, well, no, because the only virtue of Twitter, as far as I can see, other than being snarky, is letting people know when I posted something. Yeah. And I, yeah. there's always a d- direct relationship between, the, the it, it is a sewer, but there was always a direct relationship between I just did this thing. It's on Twitter now, which is why there's a little Twitter button on Blogger mm-hmm, um, right. and traffic. So my traffic has dropped um, noticeably uh, because people I'm so, just. I'm don't... sorry about that because you're writing a lot more. I, I'm writing a lot more, and I, I've been doing I'm a lot more in, photoshops. Yeah, I'm doing stuff, that, and I enjoy it, and I feel good, and it's it, there's sort of a rhythm. But the thing is, um, it is perceptible, and yeah. it is it's it's not. There's a there's a penalty to not being on Twitter as yeah. as much as it might seem like a frivolous thing and, and just a throwaway thing. And if you're not hooked into a you don't if you don't have a byline in a magazine or you're not hooked into a larger network, really the only way to promote your work is by social walking, media. Yeah, yeah. By being a one man band, walking down the middle of the street and banging a drum. And they took my drum away. So um there's a bunch of stuff out there. You're all, of course, welcome to visit me at driftclass.blogspot.com where I'm coming up on my 16th blog anniversary. Oh so I've been doing this a long time. But that I just wanted to mention I appreciate people who are who are saying restore bring this guy back this was just bullshit and the people who are taking my posts and smuggling them out and putting them on Twitter where people can see them because that's why I write them. driftglass.blogspot.com. If you yes. want more drift glass in your life that's where you go. Damn right. Marjorie Taylor Green is where, or as we call her, Ma- Madge Traitor Green. Madge Traitor Green. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I wanted to, everyone probably knows what's going on. We're, we're taping this on Friday. So everyone is familiar with what's been going on this week who listens to this podcast. There's, there was a great deal of drama about her future and would voter take her out of Congress or take her committees away, et cetera. I'd like to start talking about how she used all the magic words. Mm-hmm. from the Republican playbook that have always been used by Republicans like her to weasel out of accountability. And and I just, I picked out like six off the top of my head, but I'm sure there's more, but they're, they're all in there. And you, and you can just go through and check, check the boxes. First, whatever terrible things she had said, don't count because they were, and I'm quoting now, words of the past. And Republicans should never be held accountable for things they said in the past. May I interrupt you? Of course. And point out the quote of the day from Jim Jordan. Oh, see, I was I was having such a good day. Sure. Rock and roll. Jim Jordan said today that everybody's done something in the past they're not proud of. Sure. <laughs> and all of Twitter is like, um. You want to specify? You want to be clear about that? You want to? Yeah. And, and here's the thing. And just to, to amplify that thought, um, every criminal says, don't look in the past. <laughs> Yeah, every, that's every true. Says, Don't look in my basement because that's where the fucking evidence is. So, of course, and this is absolutely consistent across all time and space. 
This is why it bugs the shit out of me that we're just, there's a massive push to pretend that history began in 2016 because people, guilty people, do not want you talking about their past. Right, and this is right. Absolute, this is Newt Gingrich saying, if you take what I said yesterday and hold it against me today, you're you're lying. This is about health care. This was back when yeah, he was yeah. number one guest on Meet the Press, which is how well, he was it. talking about right wing social engineering versus oh, left wing right. social that's engineering. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And he got in big trouble and said, I didn't say that. If anybody tries to use that in an ad against me, la la la, backsies, backsies. It's right. it's inaccurate. Right. And this happens I reject all the what time. what I said yesterday. This, happens, yes. this is why memory is is our superpower, but it's also our curse because mm-hmm, there is mm-hmm. an absolute tidal pushback against ever holding people accountable, especially in the media, especially on the right, accountable for the shit they said. Um, second, whatever crazy shit she may or may not have done, the liberal media is as bad or worse. Yep. So, you know, hey, whatever, I might have said, you know, assassinate Nancy Pelosi and Jewish space lasers, but the liberal media is so much worse. They lie all the time What with their Jewish conspiracies and make, oh, did I say it again? I'm terribly sorry. But that was in the past now, so that doesn't count anymore. Uh-huh. Um, I said that three seconds ago. It doesn't count. Right. And third, whatever she believed, it wasn't her fault. Mm-hmm. Because, and this is where the passive voice becomes so important. She was allowed to believe bad things. Because, you see, Republicans have no agency. They can't choose to stop <laughs> listening to Fox News or turn off Rush Limbaugh. They have no control over what goes on in their tiny, mushy brains. They're, all of this stuff is just things that happen to them. They, have, they exist in a world, or a reactive world, where they control nothing, including the remote control. Fourth, cancel culture. Because <laughs> that's a magic <laughs> word now. <laughs> Believe me, as someone who used to be on Twitter, I understand what cancel culture is. And what's also, going on with her ain't The number it. of Democrat Party... Yeah. You know, just invoking Rush Limbaugh parlance was oh, God. ever present. Yeah. Uh, number five, she loves her children because, you know, <laughs> that's great. Good for you. Yeah. I guess, is that a uniquely conservative value? No. I don't think so. No. And finally, and most importantly, Jesus. Which got her the standing ovation among yeah. the House Caucus. Oh, God. Saying that Jesus oh, forgives oh. my sins. He's, she, she's, she's. She's not perfect, but she's forgiven. Forgiven. And which yes. made my uh my uh, uh wife uh Bible bitch sit up and go, Ah <laughs> That's right. Um, that but, that uh you know, Jesus gives you a get out of jail for being an asshole card yes. every five seconds. Yes. yes. It's just yes. it's like it as as I've used this analogy before, it's like the um the uh, uh, letters of transit in Casablanca. You can't mm-hmm. challenge them. You can't mm-hmm. question them. They're just, they they give you a free pass no matter what. Nobody can stop you. And that's just the rules. These are the rules. And we all, and the reason Marjorie Taylor Greene or, or Marge Trader Greene knows these are the rules is because every fucking person she works with on the right have used them at one point or another to get out of some shit going back yeah. for decades. Mm-hmm. So why wouldn't she do this? This is what Donald Trump did for four years over mm-hmm. and over and over. Why do you think he, you know, Tear gassed a bunch of peaceful protesters so he could stand in front of a church and wave a Bible that he's never read in his fucking life. Because Jesus. Mm-hmm. This is mm-hmm. this is their playbook. And and the only way to stop them is to take their playbook away from them. And to and I think the Biden administration is doing a bang up job of that, as are Democrats in Congress. Yep. Speaking of which, you wanted to talk about AOC. I did. Mm-hmm. I wanted to talk about Tuesday night and uh how traumatic that was for a lot of us. Yeah. Uh, hearing AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's testimony, and that's what it was, mm-hmm. about what happened to her and what what it was like to be in the Capitol on January 6th. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that, that there were people in the building trying to kill her, wanting yes. to kill her, yes. planning to kill her. And she knew that. And she knew that she might not be a mom someday because she might be murdered within the next 24 hours, Mm -hmm. hiding for six hours. And uh, I just, I just got to say, Republicans are good at two things. Um, They're good at manufacturing dumb grievances, which is something that Seth Meyers said this week. Mm -hmm. Uh, And they're good at traumatizing women. Mm -hmm. And I was traumatized on, on Tuesday night by all of this. You had to deal with that. Uh, and thank you very much for dealing with that because I was in really bad shape. You pretty much said, get in the shower and then go to bed. I'm going to yeah. tuck you in. And, and a big, <laughs> big was, hugs was, in between. Big hugs in between. It was a real mess. Um, yeah. Well, you know. And it it was just, 
it was traumatizing hearing it. It was traumatizing understanding how it happened Mm -hmm. and uh, that there were people the next day. And I knew this even while I was listening to it. I said, they're going to be right wingers tomorrow calling her a liar. Uh And sure enough, her colleagues, there were colleagues in the house calling her a liar. Uh, Candace Owens, who is, you know, the grifting liar uh, on the right, who is assigned with lying about AOC. And she went into high gear. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is their jam. Um, Calling her a liar, gaslighting. It couldn't possibly have happened the way you say it did. It's all a way of abusing women. And changing the Uh, subject. And, and well, that's that's what gaslighting is. is yeah. You couldn't possibly have experienced what you say your eyes and ears experienced. Mm-hmm. Um, and you must be crazy. You must not be experiencing reality. You're hysterical. You're this, you're that. And one of the really difficult things about the last couple of weeks since the inauguration, it has felt a lot like getting out of a bad, abusive marriage for me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Just... Okay, it's over. That's great. I'm glad. Now what? And how do I deal with the PTSD of that? How do we all deal with the PTSD of the last four years? And it's going to take time. Um, it is not uh, helpful. <laughs> the the move on caucus on the right now of oh just forget about it. Move on to the next thing. Mm-hmm. You know you you can't punish us because that was in the past. And Donald Trump isn't president anymore. And on and on. You can't. Uh, you can't pursue justice because that's not fair. That's not fair. Right. That's not fair. And all of that gaslighting is going to go on for the next decade, you know, that this didn't really happen. And it's not as bad as you say it is. Uh, both sides. <laughs> We're going to have a lot of both sides. Mm-hmm. Uh, but thank you, Drickless, for being there for me. Oh, and, always. Um, always. And uh, I, I also wanted, this is on a lighter note, but I also wanted to, for some reason, I linked this in our notes that right wing media is suddenly very concerned about the color of Air Force One and the continuation of Space Force. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, uh, two things, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, the first is, and I mean this half seriously, um, all that being said, since that is all very true, you should definitely not read David Brooks's column today. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody take a drink, no matter what. Because smack in the (laughs) middle of it, and I've already talked to you about this, so this is not going to come as a surprise. It's not as triggering as as it might have been if you'd broken it to me right in the middle of recording. But but smack in the middle of him, like, you know, it's it's just a shame. Maybe there's some justification for the Biden administration not, you know, negotiating with Republicans. But uh, David Brooks, I'm quoting him directly now. The Democratic Party is not emotionally ready to enact the kind of government Biden promised. I think this is a mistake, but you can't argue with an emotion. You can't turn on trust like a light switch. It takes time. And I just read that and go, you fucker. Yeah. You fucker. And it's like, this isn't the Republicans' fault. This Mm -hmm. is, you know, the Democrats are just not emotionally prepared. And this is spoken like a man rushing through marriage counseling as fast as possible so he can go back to cheating on his wife with his girlfriend. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. He's not mm-hmm. interested in discussing or litigating why Democrats have no faith in the GOP, probably because people like David Brooks kept telling Democrats that it's fine. The number one um, Republican whisperer during the Obama administration mm-hmm. was David Brooks. Mm-hmm. He kept telling, just bend over further, just grab your ankles harder, just just give away more. And they just kept rolling over him. And the minute Barack Obama said, fuck it, we're not doing this, David Brooks said, oh. I was a sap forever believing that he would change, that politics was changed. And it's just, and nothing changes with him. He is, you can just tell he's delighted to get back to being able to lie about both siderism. So, and number two. That's all he's going to say about David Brooks, folks. That's that's it. That's it. But number two, (laughs) just in in terms of changing the subject, you could really see it um, during the, during the uh, laying in state in the funeral for, for Officer Sicknick. Yeah. Um, It was on, on CNN, carried it live and in full. Um, MSNBC carried it live and in full and Fox news was doing some other shit. I don't know what they were doing, but it wasn't that anything, but anything, that. but anything, yep. but, um, cause they're just not going to talk about it. Cause that's not, mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. flies in the face of back the blue. They don't back the blue. They back the blue when the when blue is shooting black people. Right. When it's hating black people. Yeah. yeah when killing black, killing on our black men. Yeah. But, but as, as people have 
been saying for a lot longer, I think Hal Sparks especially, a lot longer, and John Fugel saying, long before Trump, is why do you think these people are armed to the teeth and talking about overthrowing the government? That means eventually they're going to start shooting cops. They mm-hmm. have to. Mm-hmm. They have to. Mm-hmm. They have to breach law enforcement to overthrow the country, right? So they're talking about arming themselves for the day when they start killing police officers and killing people in the military because there's no other way to overthrow the government, and that's what they want to do. And they're armed to the teeth to do it. So quit pretending these people give a shit about law and order. They give. Mm-hmm. They give a shit about white privilege and authoritarianism and power. And power. Yeah, and that's authoritarian it. power. And um, they're funded by the Mercers. Yes, they are. I did want to mention that um, an old friend of mine. Friend of the pod, really, Matthew Dowd. Um, oh, stop! <laughs> <laughs> Just, now wait a uh, minute. I want to. I want to pull back for a minute because sure, sure, sure. I want our listeners to know that we have turned a page at this podcast, and we are yeah. not going to just talk about. We're not going to have hours on end of David Brooks and Matthew Dowd no. and all of no. all of Drift Glass's bugaboos. No, that's why I have a blog. He's he's he has a blog. A mm-hmm. and B. He, there is not much new to say about these folks unless, unless in the context of what we're already talking about, that is true. they appear in the news this week. Yes, and they and did. And it just so happens that David Brooks appeared, he, he was talking exactly on the topic that related mm-hmm. to me, mm-hmm. and uh, Matthew Dowd is shopping for a new gig for something. There's a lot of people shopping for a new gig there are. in media right now. There are. Uh, you might say and, there are. They're in medias res. <laughs> yeah, well, and and Matthew Dow was ABC News political chief analyst, and he left. He's he's done. Yeah, he didn't say why. There's no mention of what happened or maybe why they you're off Twitter that he sees no reason to be. You I know, tell you, as engaged anymore. It, Twitter's no fun without me. So you know, <laughs> a bunch of people are leaving or changing gigs. Yeah, he's he's and he's clearly this isn't he's not out of broadcasting. That's the thing. He's not out. He's not. He hasn't lost interest in shooting off his big dumb mouth on TV. He mm-hmm. just doesn't want to do it at ABC anymore for whatever reason. So he's um, shopping his uh, for a new gig at MSNBC. He was on twice in two days this week. He's probably on this right week. now. Yeah, yeah, just this week. Right. Um, he was on with his very close, good personal friend, Nicole Wallace. And then he was on with his very good, close personal friend, Chris Hayes, um, broadcasting from apparently a dirt cabin somewhere in the wilds of America. And he doesn't have a book out or anything. No, he's looking it's for a just, job. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, and he was saying things that anybody could say. And um, uh, But he's got – he's in the club. So he gets to go wherever mm-hmm. he wants to go. Now, Matthew Dowd is most well-known for running George W. Bush's 2004 re-election campaign and for being ABC News chief political analyst for the past few years and being completely wrong about politics pretty much all the time and getting mm-hmm. into Twitter fights mm-hmm. with me – which Mr. Dowd would invariably lose and go away right, crying. That's true. That and is true. <laughs> it was bad and he was dumb. But the, here's the thing. And this is where it comes into the, the context of the media. Right. And and the news this week. Right. The news this week. Matthew Dowd and his political twin, Ron Fournier, they were always together, spent the entire 2016 election season and most of 2017 insisting there was no substantive difference between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, that both sides were equally terrible. And should always be reported as such. If you're going to talk about anything Donald Trump's doing, you've got to talk about Hillary's emails because both sides are equally terrible. That's just how journalism is done. Um, the only principled thing to do in 2016 was to vote third party. And suggesting in any way that the Republican voters were crazy or racist or stupid was despicable. A terrible, terrible blight and a horrible thing to do. Also, um, calling me and my readers stupid on Twitter for saying otherwise, for arguing with him. That was him back then. For the last couple of years, Matthew Dow 2.0 has been insisting that there is a vast existential difference between the parties, (laughs) that anyone who's doing the both sides thing is a hack who should be run out of the journalism business because that's just what journalism is, and that an overwhelming number of Republican voters are, in fact, crazy or racist or both, and blocking me on Twitter for, you know, reminding him of the shit he used to say, Mm -hmm. because I think there Mm -hmm. should be some price, some price for, for being that fucking wrong when it really mattered. And then suddenly deciding to reverse yourself entirely, which is fine, but you should really own what you said. But again, that happened in the past, and the past is, you know, off limits. And he's not writing a book called I Was Completely Wrong. Oh, God, no. By Matthew no. Dowd. He's, he, but he, he is on MSNBC twice this week. And what yes. was he talking about on MSNBC? Uh, the, the deep, deep, deep roots of racism in America and how <laughs> uh, we really screwed up with Reconstruction 
and how Lincoln <laughs> was shot. You know, I don't know if you knew this. Lincoln was murdered, and and it <laughs> would have been better if Lincoln weren't murdered because then we would have had Reconstruction done well. And that's it. I mean, it's like literally no other person could possibly say these things. On only Matthew Happy- Dowd. Happy uh, Black History Month from Matthew Dowd. Yeah. <laughs> Matthew Dowd. Um, and then, hey, hey, I want to talk about Marjorie Trader Greene. One oh, more thing that uh, Democrats once again had to step in and clean up the Republican mess. Yes, yes, they did, and vote her out of her committees mm-hmm. because Republicans wouldn't. And we need to talk about Steny Driftglass. Yeah, we Stenny, do. Steny, whenever do. Steny's on, we always give a shout out to yeah. Steny on yeah. the TV, and. I always think of Steny Hoyer as, um, you know, Nancy Pelosi knows that there are fucking misogynists out there Mm -hmm. and she really isn't impressed with them. But she's got Steny there at her right hand. If they really need to hear it from a guy. Right. Steny will do it. He's there. Yeah. He's been like an end table, you know, he's there. He is Nancy Pelosi's right hand person in the house. And he has no ambition to be to replace her. He's he is totally loyal to Nancy. Yeah. yeah. And uh, you know, when when you need a guy to go and, you know, whatever, clean off the bumper, he's there yeah. to do it. Sure. But this week, man, his speech on behalf of women in the House, women Democrats specifically in the House, who have been targeted by Marjorie Taylor Greene and making Republicans look at it. Yeah. Having a gigantic cardboard printout of her campaign's Marjorie Taylor Greene's tweet, her with an AR-15 targeting the squad, the squad's worst nightmare. Mm -hmm. And uh, he walked it over to them and made them look at it and pointed out they aren't the squad. They're people. Two of them are mothers. Just, you know, Marjorie Taylor. I love my kids. That excuses everything I want to do. Well, here here's two women that between them have six children. Mm hmm. And uh, the third one just wants to uh, make sure her constituents have health care and food. Yeah. Uh, which makes her a, the total enemy of, you know, the right. Radical communist socialist uh, Rad- enemy of the right. Right. Yeah. right. Worthy right. of extinction. And worthy of death. Worthy yeah. of extinction. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Because of misogyny. Mm-hmm. And I, I did want to ask you about that as an aside. Uh, sure. This is a question that's not in our notes, Uh-oh. and maybe it's too long a question to ask, but it, it occurred to me thinking about these uh, MAGA invaders of the Capitol, yeah. in, insurrectionists. Yeah. When we talk about black men getting into gangs, getting into trouble, doing drugs, et cetera, mm-hmm. you know, white people have a trope about that, which is racist. Yes. Um. On the other hand, I have seen many examples in the black community where there have been interventions of, you know, looking for ways to prevent gangs from from people joining gangs, you know, interventions for that and Mm -hmm. creating communities for young people to join and be a part of. Often led by former gang members. Right. Right. And I just wonder what. Our responsibility, I say this collectively because that's how I think. What Uh is our responsibility as white people in this country to look at people who are attracted to these white nationalist insurrectionist groups? I'm not saying let anyone off who's committed a crime. That's Mm -hmm. not what I'm saying. But how do we prevent that kind of, you know, adoption? Because what, what we know is... Shitty, there's shitty fathers out there. Yep. In every race, there's a lack of community. There's a lack of economic opportunity. There's a there's racism on on the white side. There's racism and violence and gun ownership and a whole lot of things. Mm-hmm. And I don't see it as my job to fix that. And I wonder if it is my job to fix that. Well, do you see what I'm? Do you see what I'm asking? I do. I do. And like, don't be a Nazi. <laughs> We yeah. need to write jingles about that or something. You know, Don't come up with be. some PA says, you know, it's really not nice to storm the Capitol, folks. Nazi, hey, folks. not cool is what it is. It's not cool. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. We, we need uh, Nancy Reagan to have Mr. T on her lap going, just say no to fascism. See, yeah. see that's it. That's um, what I'm talking about. With, yeah. with, uh, with Jim Jordan on her lap saying, just <laughs> um, I, far be it from me to try to parse the differences between the two. Uh, right, I was right. I was briefly a million years ago involved in a um, program to do gang intervention. I worked for um, uh, uh organization that got 
jobs for ex-offenders. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. one of their projects that I was pulled into uh, because there was really no one else to do it at the time uh, was this sort of complex gang intervention thing. I, I went to classes and I learned a lot of stuff and I met a lot of interesting people. Um, and one of the one of the keys was uh, get people early mm-hmm. and get someone in there who's been through the same experience as them, mm. uh, who they can trust yeah. and and talk to yeah. them in, you know, like I've been there. It, it's not quite scared straight. It's more like I have, you know me. Yeah, you, I have yeah. these tattoos because I was in the same gang as you. I'm mm-hmm. telling you right mm-hmm. now, there's you got to to save your life, yeah. to save your life. Yeah. And, and you need to help me repair the community because we have hurt the community. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. There is no one on the right who can do that. Yeah. And the reason is simple. It, and it's it's tragic. And, and the reason I say that, uh, the reason I approach it this way is this is what, by and large, liberals have been trying to do mm-hmm. since as long as I can remember. I mean, mm-hmm. telling conservatives, you're going down, you're going the wrong way. You're going, you're Mm going to hurt yourself. You're going to hurt the community. You're going to hurt the nation. You say you love for God's sakes, please stop this. I've been doing it as far as I can remember since the eighties, since the nineties. And it never worked ever. No, because you're a liberal and they don't want to listen to you. And, and and if, if I walked into a biker bar and said, come on, everybody, it's time, it's time to give up the leather and follow Jesus. Come on. Now, little <laughs> child might want to do that because, you know, that's, that's – and she'd probably get away with it too because she's, she's you charming. You need to go vegan, everybody. Come on, people. Put, put down the chicken and pick up the vegan. <laughs> and the bikers would go, she's adorable. Let's give that uh-huh. a try, guys. Um, but the, the reason it didn't work is not necessarily because I'm a liberal because everybody knows I'm a liberal. Um, because in, in most cases where I was doing it personally, like people I worked with or people I knew from work, I was persistent. Mm-hmm. I was a constant presence that they knew wasn't crazy and was well-read and, and well-versed in their own party and their own philosophy. I could quote Ayn Rand back to them. I could ask them why they don't know about the Powell memo, things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And it didn't work. It didn't matter because – and and. He, They'd come and say this terrible thing and this terrible thing, and I'd say it's wrong, and then they'd go away, and it would blow up in their face, say, see, I told you, and they never fucking learned because they couldn't admit they were wrong before anything, before anything. They were, they've been trained. You can never admit you're wrong. This is why, you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene is so successful because she can admit she's wrong. You can only mm-hmm. admit that mm-hmm. you're, you were, you're flawed and saved by Jesus. Second thing is there is no giant multi-billion dollar media corporation among gang members telling right. them you that right. anyone but us is lying to you. Right. <laughs> that you can't right. listen to anyone. Anyone who tells you anything you don't want to hear is lying to you. Mm-hmm. And I, I have example after example in my file in my personal life where someone on the right, whether it's Peggy Newton that one time or Kathleen Parker that one time, suddenly discovered by because they said the wrong thing and they were attacked by the mob. They were just Their lives are threatened and they got a shit ton of email that you and I get all the time. You and Mm -hmm. I see this all the time, but -hmm. they never saw it because they never told the the wing nuts something they didn't want to hear. And suddenly they noticed that, oh my God, where are these crazy people coming from? Well, you built them. You Mm -hmm. trained them to be this way. You trained them not to listen to anyone who tells them shit they don't want to hear. So intervention becomes impossible because the minute um, someone leaves Fox News (laughs) to go elsewhere, they're dead to me. Yeah, They're dead right, right, um, what, right. What's her name? Megan Kelly. Yep, yep. Megan Kelly. I I was with a local pillar of the community, a, a rock rib crackpot. Vince Foster was murdered conservative, who's also a pillar of the community. Uh, and we're talking about this sort of thing. And, and he, he didn't really trust her anymore. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't think. I, I don't think she's she's on with me anymore. I don't think she's on my side anymore. I don't. I don't know. It's, it's and he was like big on this guy named uh, Tucker Carlson. Uh-huh, uh, I'm like you're uh-huh. training a hot blonde for this nebbish. Why? Because he's telling me the shit I want to believe, and she's not. So she's dead to and me he now. Has the institutional support and the gigantic microphone. Yeah, and she doesn't have, and that that explains why she's so desperate to get back on the air. Right. So yeah, who's the because she's nothing even so, even with her however many millions of dollars she got to go away it doesn't matter she doesn't exist well, her and, existence and, depends on being on the air and, yeah and if you're in a gang what are the consequences of being wrong prison or death mm-hmm. or your mm-hmm. family is destroyed or whatever mm-hmm. what's the consequence of being wrong the right you, you, you in two years you get to do it again 
Right. And you get a whole or, bunch or of people. Or tomorrow you could just yeah. do it again. And a whole right. bunch of people around you who tell you you were never wrong. There, there right. are Jewish space lasers. You can trust right. me on this. Right, right, and, right. And, a, right. and 30 years of reinforced um, conditional behavior over mm-hmm. and over and over again, teaching you, you should never listen to anyone who tells you what you don't want to hear. And mm-hmm. that's where I mm-hmm. have a, that's where I just, it grinds my teeth when I see people who were right-wing radio people who now want to pretend they're woke, and maybe they really are, who don't want to talk about how these people got this way. Right. Because right. the first thing you do is diagnose the problem correctly. And the reason mm-hmm. they got this way was because of you. And if you don't want to even acknowledge that, uh, they will commiserate. I, you know, I mm-hmm. listen to these podcasts. They will commiserate. Like, geez, these people don't listen to anybody. They need trusted voices to tell them, you know, to stop <laughs> being crazy. I'm like, dude. Do, do, do tell the one line. Tell them the one line from Charlie Sykes. I asked you to do it. Oh, the, the, which the, one line? The thing, the thing that not a lot of people know this. Oh, yeah. Not a lot of people know this. This is this is cracks me up. <laughs> and I'm <laughs> doing too. it. I'm only doing this because my wife is asking. I me. asked him to, t- um, to mention this. This is because uh, I listen to this stuff. And it's it's and remember, Charlie Sykes was on was was Wisconsin's uh, Rush Limbaugh for like 30 years. Mm-hmm. He mm-hmm. is a trusted voice, but he told them that something they didn't want to hear and something he's dead to me. So the whole theory just falls apart because he was that guy and then now he's not. Uh, but he's talking to uh, A.B. Stoddard on his podcast yesterday going, you know, not a lot of people understand this. or They, they don't understand this as well as I do or whatever the, exactly he was saying. But, you know, Republicans, they're, they're not just afraid of Trump. They have a voter problem. <laughs> they have a base problem. The, the Republican base is crazy and it's all over the country. And I'm not sure people, not re- people know this, by the I'm way. I'm not sure folks. people really understand this. I'm like, <laughs> you fucker, what do you think we've been saying for decades? And you've been calling uh, us crackpots and lunatics and, and alarmists and telling us to shut and cancel up. Cancel culture. And yes. Cancel. And, and you can't blame the voters. We've been heard, heard that dozens oh. and dozens of times. Yeah, you can't well, blame the voters, right? Well, and that, that was coming out of, to bring it all back to Math, Matthew Dowd was saying, yeah. you can't yeah. call Republican voters. That's just, that's despicable. Calling a whole block of people crazy. Oh my God, they're crazy. Oh, yeah. And, and yeah. you know what? I don't even need to hear Drift Glass was right. I just need to hear from some one of these people at some point in the next decade. You know what? The left really was kind of right about it. Well, apparently, uh, Nicole Wallace just said that on the air. I, like, I just saw on Twitter. The well, left was exciting. right about the right. So we'll have to go and look at that after we record. Damn. Well, I guess we can just shut this yeah. podcast down. Bad go back timing. To, yeah, bad timing. Well, no, it's great timing. That's great timing. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. now we should put more of those people. The left was right people, about the right. It was, what I, was the quote I was given on Twitter. So, And, and we now we see. should put... Now let's put the people who were right all along on the air. Let's move Steve put Schmidt. Put on your to, show, Nicole put, Wallace. Yeah. Move Steve, your, your close personal friend, Steve Schmidt, your close personal friend, Rick Wilson. They're fine. Move them to four. Give them that 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 sweet Hugh Hewitt spot at five in the morning. <laughs> 5 a.m. on Sundays. Yeah. yeah they, they deserve it. They've earned it. And put the people who were actually right all the time on the air. Now admit. Um, I don't have the dashing good looks of a Rick Wilson or the full head of hair or of a Steve Schmidt. No, but I you could, have both of those things. I, I, I do. <laughs> um, but it doesn't, I don't, and this is not me, argu- I, it sounds like it, but it's not me arguing for my privilege. I'm a little blogger in the middle of the Midwest, but put somebody, put some people on the air who are willing to say these things out loud and do it consistently. This should be mm-hmm. the the party line on on MSNBC, on the left, yeah. on the lefty station. Now, maybe it's it's breaking through, and I'd like to jump ahead on this if you don't mind. The, the good journalism versus bad journalism. Since we are talking about the difference between good journalism and bad journalism um, in the context of what it means to our politics and our culture, there is a war right now over who gets to define the past. Mm-hmm. It's terribly important. Who gets to define the past? What, and interestingly enough, Drift Class is going to talk about two people that he doesn't talk about all the time. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. I, I, because I read things and they come across my desk. Uh, uh, our alert reader, Walt, um, sent along an article from the Atlantic um, by uh, Peter Wiener. Now, Peter Wiener, if you don't know him, is a longtime Republican speechwriter analyst. He wrote speeches for, I think, George W. Bush. He's a th- wing nut think tank guy. He's an unreconstructed Iraq war pimp, but he's woke, man. He is, you know how woke he is? He voted third party in 2016. That's how <laughs> woke he is. So he's crazy woke, which means he oh. should obviously have a job on the Atlantic writing about culture because he's just that woke. Now, I read his critique, his take on the Republican Party. And his basic take is, 
um, exactly what we've been telling you about, um, that the Republican Party can still be saved uh, because it really only the last four years are the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and he mm -hmm. large this column out. There's Star Trek references. There's like 19 paragraphs about Vaclav Havel. There's a bunch of shit about Edmund Burke. It which really is, is like trying to put together a senior paper. It, and it really is. Every it, every reference you've read in the past month from every class is going to be in the paper. And, yeah. and I, I yeah. learned that the Czech Republic really was a land of contrast. Oh, my uh, God. Which is exciting. <laughs> We're talking about the Republican Party. But this is what you get when you pay woke Republicans by the word. Yeah. You get just yeah. blah, 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 blah. But his basic thesis, when you actually go down, and I did this, and, I, and I'm actually going to work on the post and finish it later today, is the last four years are the problem. And mm -hmm, there's, there's right, a half right. a paragraph given up to, you know, there were bad actors and things happened. That's yeah, gospel. Et cetera. So, that happened in the past. Yep, you know, but yep. really, let's talk about Vaclav Havel and Star Trek some more because that's really where the meat <laughs> of the issue is. And the Republican Party uh, can still be saved. If mm -hmm. they turn a moral corner and recover their glory, but you know, but it really is the last four years, the last five years. That's and they won't say what they're going back to George W. Bush or going back to Reagan and Iran Contra or going back to yeah. Nixon and Watergate. Those there is some happened. sort of mythical perfection yeah. of you know marginal tax rates and fiscal conservatism, of course, and uh, nothing else. They have you ever I'd, have you ever really read Bill Bennett's book of virtues, Blue Dale? <laughs> <laughs> it really absorbed that. It was Bill a, Bennett, was, yeah. yeah. That came out right around the time of the preppy handbook, yeah. I think. <laughs> well, and, and so that that was that's over at the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. That is David uh Peter Weiner on the Atlantic, um because he's a yeah, he's a neoconservative Iraq war pimp, and you they th all of those people have to have jobs forever and ever. Right. Um right. talking about the Republican Party with a very strict limitation on the time period. Four years ago is when bad, bad things happened. Before that, yeah, shit happened, but who knows? And why is he limiting it at four years? Because before four years, he was the fucking problem. Right. He right. was the guy who sure. causes, and he will not talk about it. he's not gonna talk about that. That is not what we're under discussion today. It's but, a it's an but argument. That's in all in the past, Drift Glass. And, right. and he's not he's not perfect. He's just forgiven. These are words of the past. <laughs> now you flip over to David Leonhardt in the New York Times. This is an the, example of good journalism. Covering right? the same predicate. Mm -hmm. Why is um, the Republican Party is so hard to work with. And how come the Biden administration is learning the hard lessons of the past? Well, the past, according to David Leonhardt, when it comes to learning the Republicans will fuck you over if you give them half a chance. So you shouldn't really try to negotiate with them because they cannot be trusted, even though David Brooks is disappointed that we're not emotionally <laughs> prepared to do that. Um, <laughs> David Leonhardt goes back to the Clinton administration oh. and the budget deal. It was a 50-50 tie, not one Republican vote. You know, you had to vote a tiebreaker. And, oh, my God, the Obamacare debate. Oh, my God. He goes back 30 years or so. And, mm -hmm. and here's how we got to the point where everyone in the Biden administration knows you can't fucking trust Republicans. Trust Republicans, yeah. And that is – It has nothing to do with emotional readiness no. and everything to do with experience. Yeah. <laughs> Which, you know, apparently David Brooks is incapable of learning anything more than 15 minutes. His mm -hmm. memory just wipes mm -hmm. out. So – these are two people writing in um, fairly respectable American journals of record, one of whom is telling you the Republican, the woke Republican is telling you before, 2000, before 2016, who knows what happens, but the Republican Party can be saved. And it, if it just learns the right lesson and, and over in the New York Times, like, no, 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 no. The right lesson needs to be learned over the course of 30 years, not four years. And shit happened and it kept it building and building and getting worse and worse. And that's why we're here, Peter. And that's what we mean by the context. There is a war going on right now over who gets to define the past. If Peter Weiner wins, then the past began in 2016 and all the shit that we talk about will go nowhere. And these people will regroup and they'll hide out in the mainstream media and they'll come back twice as crazy next time because that's what they've done every time before. And that's why I've, I have such a bug up my ass about making sure that the complete history of American political life in the modern era is taken into consideration when we talk about Who's to blame? What do we do? How do the people get this way? And how do we fix what they've broken? All yeah. right. And now I want to talk about the Democratic Party, Drift Glass. Let's do that. Uh, impeachment or economic relief? Why not both? <laughs> it's my, it's my yeah. headline for this. Yeah. Uh, because the House and the Senate and the White House together, working together from the same hymnal, as Rachel Maddow said, 
uh, singing from the same hymnal, there are enough of them to move the news cycle in the direction that they want it to go. We are. And I was really impressed with, you know, they had this votorama last night, Thursday night. And so there was that. The, the headline was 530 in the morning, just in time for, you know, people to wake up and get their headlines together was here's our MVP, Madam Vice President, breaking a tie. Mm-hmm. And here we go ahead with COVID relief. And uh, I, I felt like I was being sacrilegious typing this in and out. So I mentioned this to you. <laughs> yes, you did. That today's Democrats are as coordinated as Republicans were in 1994. Mm-hmm. Uh, Newt Gingrich, for as evil as he was, knew how to discipline members of the House on messaging. Mm-hmm. And they had a contract with America. They had ads in the TV guide. Mm-hmm. which I had never seen political ads in the TV guide before. It was brilliant to put the co- print the contract with America in the TV guide where everyone would see it. Yep. And average people who never read newspapers or any political content at all would see it. And it was, you know, 10 steps and this is it. And here's what we're going to do. And you hear every Democrat that comes on television today said people are hurting. Mm-hmm. There was just such a message discipline about that. People are hurting. We want to help people. Not politicizing it, but but politicizing it. Uh-huh. I mean, th- there is nothing more political than if you can claim the mantle of the American people need this and we are providing it. Mm-hmm. And that, I'm telling you, that discipline and that <laughs> is, is absolutely gold. It is political gold because every time you hear someone on television, this and this is what Fox News did. Again, I feel like I'm being completely sacrilegious by comparing Democrats to Republicans in this way. But Fox News would have guests on all day long, but all of them would have their talking points from the Fox News producers. Uh-huh. Here's what here's how you're going to say and here's what you're going to say so that the audience who is being brainwashed at that point would say, Oh, look, Sarah Palin agrees with Dan Bongino. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> well, it's that, it's that salesman. T- it takes 12 touches to change a person's mind. Right. Right. You know, oh, I heard it from 12 different sources. That's all the same TV network. It's all the same people. News. Yeah. 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 And so uh, this message, the messaging is really terrific. And then the additional benefit of having both Andy Slavitt and uh, they call him Tony now. Yeah. <laughs> Anthony Fauci, Tony Fauci. Release the uh, Fauci. Release the Fauci. Fauci's off the leash. He's doing YouTube videos and mm-hmm. Twitter videos where they're just asking him a couple questions about does he still run? Does he get up and what time does he get up in the morning? And by the way, are the vaccines safe? Mm-hmm. You know, it's adorable. He's doing <laughs> he's doing the Teen Choice Awards, I understand. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You get, the MTV Awards, yeah, I'm sure he you is. Get, you get five different <laughs> vaccines. Which one do you want? Which one do you choose? Uh, yeah, well, that's oh. the equivalent yeah. of putting it on the TV guide back exactly. in 1994. Exactly. You're going like, to oh. reach these kids where they are. So, uh, yeah, I, I just think it's remarkable. And as I retweeted that, that Tony, it's Tony Fauci on this Twitter thing. Uh-huh. You know, it's, it's amazing that the asshole on The Apprentice – only had, you know, one one hundredth of the PR chops mm-hmm. that the Joe Biden, Joe Biden administration has. I know. And of well, course, as you said, uh, asshole on The Apprentice was heavily dependent on the producers of The Apprentice to clean up his shitty diaper yeah. and make him look good. Yeah. So uh, and of course, he thought it was all him. Um, yeah. Well. Chuck Schumer even yeah. can be taught. Yeah. <laughs> this is the this is the Aladdin scene. He can be taught. <laughs> and well, for I, him to remember the past, this is the other part of it. They're uh-huh. all remembering the past and reminding people of 2009 yep. and 2010 and the health care bill that had 100 no 200 Republican amendments in it and then they complained it was too long. Yeah. We well, can't Ch- vote on this. It's it's 1200 pages. We can't and, vote on this. And finally Chuck Grassley I think confessed in a conference. So in Obama's we, book. Yeah, yeah. If we put yeah. everything in it you're going to vote for it. Uh no. No. Well then yeah. why are we having these well to to run out the clocks to make you yeah. lose and it, it's like it never occurred to anyone in the Republican party that losing meant millions of people going without health care and suffering. Yep. 
It didn't yeah. matter to them. And millions of people and taking this shit away, tr- threatening to take it away was putting people in this house, my wife and our family and millions of it people was across traumatizing country, women. Yes, it was over and over Mothers. again, over yeah. and over again. Yeah. And it, it yeah. didn't occur to them that this, that, that fucking us over and, and, and putting our lives in danger would be, you know, a bad thing. And would permanently would radicalize us against them to yeah. where every midterm is critical. Mm-hmm. Yes. I've, I've heard so many people, and I don't, I don't want this to be as some people say, it's just that I don't want to quote people in my personal life that I talk to. But Deep background. Just call it deep background. <laughs> deep, on deep background. Huh? Saying, you, you know, we got to win the midterms. You yeah. know, 2022, we got to win the midterms. And it's not, it's not just my, my crew at Crooks and Liars. It's people... Just average people that I'm talking to. Oh, you know, by the way, we got to meet, win the midterms. And I thought I was going to have to fight for that. You know, I thought I was going to have to say, you know, translate my excitement about that to people and make them do it. And that's not the case. People are geared up for this already and realize that every election matters. Mm-hmm. And part of it is PTSD from Trump. They they are never going to go through 2016 ever again. And conservatives and Republicans got what they want. They made liberals mad. Congratulations. Uh, we're done with you. But we do have to talk about our own congressman. We do. We do. And I, I think we <laughs> should start by uh, pointing out that every single Illinois Republican congressman disgraced themselves this week by mm-hmm. voting to uh, uh, Marjorie Trader Green to keep her committee assignments. The, mm-hmm. the new face of the Republican mm-hmm. Party. Um, this includes our two local representatives, Rodney Davis and Darren LaHood. And the great white hype, Adam Kinzinger. <laughs> if you own a newspaper or a television set, or read a uh, or, or if you read a newspaper, or if you're near a window where something is playing, you know who Adam Kinzinger is because the collective American political press just gave him the microphone this week to talk about how, yeah, you know what, you got to stand up to these guys. You know, Republicanism is the is the we're, we're the party of Lincoln, and uh, we got to get uh, doing the Lincoln stuff again and. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm a serious man and I'm standing up to these guys. And of course, if you read his comments deep Mm -hmm. into his ad, which is a six minute uh, pitch for running for president or or the Senate or something is, you know, do we want to be like the left and go backwards? (laughs) It's like, oh, fuck you. Fuck you. But you know what? When when he votes with Trump 96% of the time Mm -hmm. and when, when push came to shove, when you could actually put your vote where your your those pretty pretty words are in your mouth hole he crapped out he, he yeah. chickened and out he, he voted to keep he hurt for her to keep her committee assignments he did he did and, and so Ron, did liz cheney can you believe that of course i can of course i can because yes. this is this is we don't exist to them at all they yeah. live in a yeah. bubble where as as well the the original title for the show was um, chaotic evil versus lawful evil. Yes, that's right. Um, that's right. That's important to point out. The difference between Liz Cheney and Marjorie Taylor Greene is yeah. lawful evil versus chaotic evil. And and someone pointed out to me, and and uh, Mitch McConnell's neutral evil, because he doesn't care. <laughs> Either way is yeah. fine with him. As long as it's evil, he's okay. One of them <laughs> wants to wreck the country slowly by legally enabled means, mm-hmm. and one of them mm-hmm. wants to destroy the place because Jewish space lasers. But they're all right. the same party. They're all, and they have to, they, and if one of them leaves, the other one loses. So they can't, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. quit each other because then. Yeah, that's entire- right. She's got to have a, a Republican on those committees. That's right. what she wants as leadership. Right, right. So there's Ms. Cheney there- wants a Republican vote, even if it's crazy, is better than no vote on those committees. Right, and, right. And as, as we've been saying on this podcast almost since the beginning, never underestimate how much conservatives hate this country. Hate this country. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just a little, couple more notes on impeachment. Trump, once again, uh, has the attorneys he deserves. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they are not able to type the words United States in the heading of their response to impeachment. Also, their response was full of legal errors as well. Uh, Trump has a literal mob lawyer now, mm-hmm. David Schoen, uh, who is trying his level best to remove evidence from the impeachment trial. Yeah, we don't need evidence in a trial. We, no, he crazy. said sh- that showing videos of the attack on the Capitol would be divisive. Yeah. <laughs> but I, please don't show evidence because that would be harmful to my case. Well, and, and to be fair, those things happened in the past. Yes. Yeah, they don't count anymore. 
And you know what else happened in the past? Donald Trump's presidency, yeah. which Donald Trump does not want to admit is the case. No. And so it's there's a conflict now between those who want to argue that you can't impeach Donald Trump because he's no longer president. Of course, you couldn't indict him because he was president. So neener, neener. But uh, he wants to insist that he is still the president, that he's the 45th president of the United States. And that's all I am. And that's everything I am. And uh, never mind everything else. I am currently the 45th president of the United States. And that is going to harm his defense. Well, and the reason he has the uh, can't afford a spell check lawyers now yeah, right, is right. because his other five lawyers quit. They did. After he demanded that his defense focus on his gigantic lie that the election was stolen, which they wouldn't mm-hmm. do because they wouldn't do even though they were third tier assholes, disbarred. they're not that stupid. Yeah. Right, right. Uh, you want to talk for a minute about Lindsey Graham's FBI bluff? Oh, please. <laughs> after you. <laughs> He insisted that if you're going to bring witnesses to this trial, he's going to call in the FBI and we're going to have more evidence yeah. brought in. Yeah. And you won't want that, will you? Right. <laughs> and everyone everyone was saying, bring in the FBI, yeah. Lindsay. Come on. <laughs> As if 80 million Americans simultaneously said, don't threaten me with a good time, Lindsay. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, All so right. we do a quick news roundup. In national news, we're going to talk about the Bidening. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is a really good story. Uh, yeah. Biden this week increased the cap on refugees entering the United States to 125,000 from Donald Trump's reduction. He had reduced it to 15,000. Yeah. Today is a good day, said Representative Ilhan Omar. And the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, which is one of my favorite charities, by the way, UNHCR, uh, works very hard wherever possible to keep refugees in their home countries mm-hmm. so that once the war or the nat- natural disaster or whatever is over, uh, they can go home. They can rebuild and go home. And it's much less disruptive to their lives. It's not always possible to do that. Right. But wherever it is possible, they work very hard to do that and to help them rebuild their lives and bring them back to as much of normalcy for them as they can. Hmm. Um, but the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, Philip Filippo Grandi, said the action today by President Biden will save lives. It's yeah. that simple. Um, it is that simple. And the Biden administration is going to form a task force to reunite families separated at the border under Trump's zero tolerance immigration policy which an administration official has referred to as a moral failing, which I believe is um, diplomatic speak for fucking evil. But you can't Mm -hmm. say that, so it has to be a moral Mm -hmm. failing, which it most assuredly is. The Senate confirmed Alejandro Mayorkas as Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security, the first Latino and immigrant to lead DHS. Despite opposition from Senate Republicans, Mayorkas secured enough votes for confirmation by a 56 to 43 vote. The Department of Homeland Security has not had a Senate-confirmed secretary since April of 2019 when Trump fired Christian Nielsen. May we also say that uh, the Transportation Department has a new secretary, Pete Buttigieg. Pete Buttigieg. Yeah. Yeah. The first openly gay secretary, uh, cabinet member. And uh, so that's terrific also. He's already talking high-speed rail people. Yeah, which I'm, I'm very much looking forward to. Um, I want to. I want to be ninety minutes to Chicago. Let's just put it that way. Period. That's already being built. I'm yeah. excited about that. That's an Obama thing. Um, sure. Thanks, Obama. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> Thanks Obama. Obama. Actually, it's it's, a, it's an Obama and Dick Durbin thing. He's been really yeah, that's Dick really Durbin, focused and, on. That. And I hope they're going to change the name of the Springfield station to Biden because that's where Biden was uh, announced announced as yeah. the vice presidential candidate was yeah. here in Springfield. Yeah. Uh, speaking of Joe Biden. Uh, his administration reached a $231 million deal for $8.5 million at home over the counter COVID 19 rapid tests, which is a blessing. Yes, it is. Mm-hmm. As I said before, Biden released the Fauci to be <laughs> everywhere. He is everywhere, and it's wonderful to see. I'm also really glad to see Andy Slavitt out there because yeah. uh, he's old school and I really like him. You, you've right. been a fan since, since way back. He was. Back in his um, – <clears throat> before he went electric, he was just – you know before he was on the on the old school, on the typewriter, <laughs> the mimeograph machine, you were a fan since then. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And now for the numbers. 
78% of Americans support the $1,400 stimulus checks Biden is calling for, including 90% of Democrats and 64% of Republicans. 68% of Americans support the $1.9 trillion stimulus package. You can't get more bipartisan than that. It's very bipartisan, people. Mm -hmm. Uh, Representative Kevin McCarthy can't even pronounce QAnon anymore. He, he doesn't even know them. He said they're, they're <laughs> some sort of volunteer organization, like a coffee boy, I think, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Um, Democrats are proceeding with their plan to bypass Republicans and approve the $1.9 trillion coronavirus package on a party line basis using reconciliation. Vice President Kamala Harris cast her first tie breaking vote in the Senate this week, clearing the plan. Uh, the COVID survival package of the uh, of GOP obstruction in the Senate and sending it to the House for a vote. The difference between boots on the ground and the high castle. Yeah. Republican governor of West Virginia. Yeah. Begged Joe Manchin to abandon fiscal responsibility. Governor Jim Justice, Republican of West Virginia, told Allison Camarota, if we actually throw some money away right now, so what? We have really got to move and get people taken care of. Uh -huh. And yeah. West Virginia has done a remarkable job of getting um, nursing home patients and staff immunized against COVID. They, they're they number one in the country right now for um, every single nursing home patient in West Virginia that wants a vaccine has already had one. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're just they did it by uh, using local pharmacies. Yep. Yep. And uh, also uh, the National Guard. They yep. use the National Guard to go into nursing homes and get people immunized. So, well, I understand this is not in our notes, but I understand that um, uh, the Biden administration has called for either a thousand or ten thousand. I know I'm off by an order of magnitude of 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 troops of U.S. military mm -hmm. to right. assist in the production of. Uh, yeah, and and that's coming out this afternoon at while we're. Recording this, I yeah. know that there are going to be people in the military giving a press conference on Friday afternoon. Well, so, and the mantra is "Go big and go fast." Go big and, and go fast. Yep. If and if you shock are down with that, if you <laughs> exactly, and I love hearing that phrase. That's just crazy. Do yeah. shock and awe. It's got to be that fast. It's got to be that big. And I was, if you are a Republican and would like to get on board with doing this big and fast and now, great. But if you're not, fuck you, because. Because April is coming, and then comes June, and then comes the 2022 election, and you're now out of a job because you didn't stand with the American people. You stood on the side of Marjorie Taylor Greene. Well, um, remember when the when the when the Obama stimulus package was passed, and all these Republicans who didn't vote for it stood oh, yeah. with big checks, big old checks. Yeah, <laughs> that money just appeared out of nowhere, but it has my name on it now. So look at me, I'm I'm wonderful. Yeah, they they. Believe me, believe me, the people who served in the Obama administration have learned that lesson. They and have learned they might, that lesson. They might screw up uh, once or twice, but it's clear that they're not going to fall for the Lucy and the football again. Yeah. Well, and and uh, Rachel Maddow said no more reindeer games. Yeah. 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 Uh, more than 370 Democratic congressional aides signed an open letter to senators urging them to convict Trump for inciting a riot, quote, attack on our workplace that threatened the peaceful transition of power. The House adopted rules to fine lawmakers up to $10,000 for bypassing security measures that were enacted after the January 6th storming of the Capitol by a pro-Trump mob. They're going to take it out of their salaries. Yeah, and Rodney Davis cannot afford uh, $10,000 fines, so he'll go along no. with it. He said bullshit, but that's just too bad, Rodney. Too bad, Rodney. Uh, the Manhattan District Attorney's Office has opened an investigation into Steve Bannon. Oh, no. Who has a podcast. And you know who else is getting a podcast? Everybody. Mike Pence. Oh, God. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> is it going to be called Pensive with, with Uncle Mike? Oh. Because, no. I don't know. But, you know, he, you said you predicted with all that oh, radio sure. experience he was going to go make money on a podcast. Yeah. House impeachment managers requested that Trump testify under oath during his own Senate impeachment trial next week about his involvement in the events that led to the violent insurrection of January 6th. And several people on MSNBC last night predicted that he would testify on the Hannity show. Yeah. <laughs> He's a coward. He won't do it. He is. He wants the spotlight. He doesn't want the spotlight. You know what I mean? Right. And that is the end of the news. Each week, we post to our Facebook page and website an Internet Kitty sent in by you, the listeners. This week's Internet Kitty is Barry. Barry is an adorable black and very fluffy kitten. Barry began life as a foster kitten in the desert southwest, and as you may know, 
because of the length of the warm weather there, they have two kitten seasons. When the second round of kittens come along, often the mom cats aren't always up to full strength, so their second litter of the year can be weaker than the first. Barry was one of these second litter kitties. Barry was slow to put on weight, but in October of last year, she was finally big enough to be spayed and put up for adoption, and she was adopted. Her foster father, Jim, writes, Thanks for helping to publicize the plight of shelter kitties. Even with a trap-neuter release program, our local shelter still has hundreds and hundreds of kittens every year that need homes. In pre-COVID times, the shelter would send some kittens to animal rescues in colder climates for adoption, but that's a lot more difficult now. So if you can, Mm -hmm. visit your local shelter or Animal Protective League and adopt. Because Casa DGBG is definitely in the please adopt, don't shop category, except for Olive, who was an abandoned street kitty. Our other two are from County Rescue and the Animal Protective League. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know how Barry gained all that weight. Freshly poured cat food, our fake sponsor. Damn right. Damn right. (laughs) Whether you serve pet store perfection or dollar store dreck, Your cat will sit on the kitchen floor and demand that the food they eat is only freshly poured. Freshly poured, freshly poured. Oh, my Lord, it's freshly poured. And you can visit Barry. This is Barry from, you know, last fall and a teeny little kitten. Uh, That picture will be at our Facebook page and website. And you can send your Internet Kitty or other pet to us at our email address, proleftpodcast at gmail.com where you can also write to both of us. Don't forget, put postcard in the subject line if you would like to receive uh, our 2020 holiday New Year's card. Feel free to write us. We love hearing from you. Be aware that if you write us at any of our addresses, we reserve the right to read your email or U.S. Postal Service. Go Postal Unions! Letter on the air unless you say otherwise. Hashtag save the post office. Don't forget our gourmet coffee guideline. If you can afford to buy an espresso-based beverage for yourself, buy one for us. This is not charity. This is our job. And it's a labor of love. Approximately 1% of our listeners support this podcast with a contribution, and you can too. See our website, proleftpod.com, for details. Our PayPal postal address information is there at proleftpod.com. People are always asking me what the best way to donate is. Uh, There is no best way. It's whatever is easiest for you. And by the way, PayPal, Patreon, and uh, Buy Me a Coffee all take exactly the same amount out from your donations. So Mm -hmm. it really doesn't matter. Whatever's best for you. And if you want to send a check, that's fine, too. Please share our show on social media. And thank you so much for doing that. Hey, Drift Class, how are the Internet Kitties doing this week? The Internet Kitties would like everyone to know that the views, assumptions, and opinions expressed by Rudy Giuliani, Sidney Powell, and the MyPillow guy are strictly their own. I do not necessarily represent the opinions, beliefs, or policies of the Internet Kitties, their humans, freshly poured cat food, or anyone else. Let's think about living. Let's think about loving. Let's think about the hooping and the hopping and the bopping and the loving, loving, dubbing. Let's forget about the whining and the crying, the shooting and the dying, and the fellow with a switchblade knife. Let's think about living. Let's think about life. Professional F Podcast is recorded under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2021 DGBG Productions.